Good morning, Lubaina. How are you doing? Are you well? Yes, I'm very well, actually. Amazingly. Yeah. Good, good, good. Good to hear that. Listen, we're here to talk about your um, upcoming exhibition. I'm excited about it because I know this uh, represents another milestone in your long and illustrious career in the British arts. I know you're going to talk a little bit about that um, later, but talk about uh, this upcoming exhibition at the Tate. So, well, what you can expect is a lot of a lot of work. Um, it takes place in um, the galleries on the second floor um, in the new, new bit of Tate Modern. Um, so altogether there may be, it's difficult to say because they're not quite divided into rooms in that way, but sort of what you might think about nine rooms worth of uh, work. And some of the work are old, old favourites that if you've... Uh, uh, seen postcards or or followed the work in, in any way, people would know. So old work from the 1980s, like the greatest hits kind of thing, you know, but also some really new things that I made in the last uh, couple of years. Um, I think one of the kind of uh, the things I'm excited about is that there'll be some sound elements to it. And also that the minute you get to that second floor, whether you go up the stairs or you come out of the lift, there's already artwork. So it's like, welcome to the show type of presentation. Um, because for me, the most important thing about this show, I mean, it's been important in other exhibitions of mine, but I've really tried to work on it this time, is that I, really, and I believe it from experience, if you know what I mean, that the audience is actually the most important thing in the show. It sounds crazy, but it isn't. Because if you think about it, when you go and see an exhibition, you all the time want to know, well, how is this relating to me? What, what, where am I in this, in this scenario, in this picture? Even if it's something abstract, you, you're always thinking, how, how can I have a conversation with this work of art? So I'm trying through the whole show to give the audience the feeling and the upfront feeling that they are moving it, shaping it, making it work. A bit like when you're in a kind of a live production, it works because the audience is there that you can feel them and you can hear them and they kind of energize it. And I guess the other main thing about it is that um, it's sort of, I wanted to feel like being backstage and front stage. So a bit of the kind of buzz you get by being backstage somewhere where you see how everything works and it's all a bit messy and you think, oh, uh, it, it doesn't look like that from the front, but how I see how it works from the back. So you kind of get an insight because um, of the kinds of works I'm going to show. And then you get another opportunity with the kind of more formal paintings, you know, paintings on canvas, rectangular, you know, uh, sort of uh, traditional paintings. You get a chance to kind of be in the painting. So all the scenarios you notice, even though I painted them over quite a long period of time, they all kind of give you a space in the scene for you to climb into the painting, metaphorically speaking. So you, you sort of are deciding in that room of paintings, um, who would I be? You know, what could I say in this conversation? Where's my place in this room? So I guess I'm excited about it because it's an opportunity to try something that I haven't really been able to, to try before. I mean, lots of my exhibitions have that, as much as you can have in a public gallery, interactive kind of element to them. With this, you can't touch the works, but I'm hoping that you kind of feel that they work because you're talking to them. Um, and I'm hoping that the sound element, because you'll be able to hear the sound, 
that you just heard as you go towards another sound, but that's like being, you know, uh, anywhere. It's like being in a shop or being in the street or being at a party. It's all kind of happening at once and you move towards it or you move away from it or you stay for a long time and be still or you just kind of go through as if you're walking down the street. So I'm trying to get that feeling of energy and um, participation without it being something that is sort of like, um, it's not like a fun fair. Do you know what I mean? I wish I could no, those kind of shows. No, I, I don't really think. would like, you know. Well, I mean, there's time. There's time. Let's not rule it out, you know. No, let's, okay. let's, let's, <laughs> let's not rule it out. Um, over 50, you, I mean, you've touched on a lot of the, the variety that's going to be presented. And, I, and I, you know, I'm told is you're presenting over 50 pieces of works, essentially, in what is going to be your largest solo exhibition. So do you feel, even with all your experience and over four decades of experience in the British Black Arts movement, do you, do you feel any sense of pressure or is there, what, what fuels your kind of desire to make sure that you deliver? Well, it's certainly a huge amount of pressure, for sure. But there are loads of people helping to make it work. You know, huge, huge teams at Tate. And um, I'm represented by a gallery um, called Hollybush Gardens Gallery, and they're helping me a lot. And I have um, a team of artists that work with me in the north of England, you know, who, are, who in the past have helped me make some of these pieces of work, but also... A, uh, making sure that everything, you know, kind of works and is ready to go sort of thing. But, it, yeah, it's a huge amount of pressure because, well, it's, I want it to be, I sort of want it to be uplifting in some ways, you know, and I know that lots of the subjects that I've covered, you might think are kind of, mm, dragging up histories that maybe people would rather just forget and move on. But I do have a tendency, while I'm kind of trying to re resolve things and move forward, I, I, there are important issues, you know, that I think should keep being raised, you know, about um, equality and about contribution to the culture and belonging and all those things that I hold dear. So I want you to kind of, I want people to be kind of like, I don't know, energized by the show, but on the way, there are some really difficult moments, you know? Um, but I don't think it's, it's not a pressure, uh, what will people say, you know, like press or that sort of thing. Because I spent so long in a way with nobody in those kind of big, you know, newspaper and things ever taking any notice of it. So it's not a kind of pressure like that. It's the pressure that of having an idea and thinking it's going to work, but you, I don't know if it's going to work until people are in it and experiencing it. You know, you just can't, you, you just can't know. I mean, it's like, I it's like, a, it's like a, a band, you know. They know that in rehearsals that, that the songs work, they know how to do them, they've done the stuff. But on the night, you know, sometimes it just doesn't work. There's too much of one thing or not enough of another thing, and it doesn't do it. So I, I still feel worried after all these years that, it, that yeah, I mean, I, I guess if you didn't have butterflies in your stomach, then something wouldn't be right. Um, maybe, maybe. <laughs> yeah. but I'd, rather, I'd rather not be so nervous, really. I don't know. You'll be all right. It'll, it will all be all right on the night, as they say. And, and, and just for um, those who are interested, uh, the exhibition, and I'll repeat this at the end, the yeah. exhibition kicks off on the 25th of November and runs all the way until the 3rd of July, 2022. Um, I noticed that... Um, or I was told by some of those people <laughs> that you refer to across the mass uh, teams that exist at the Tate, mm -hmm. that um, your interest in opera um, and, you know, your whole kind of connection to um, theatre design and stuff is, has coloured uh, a lot of what's going to be presented. Talk, talk about that for me. Yeah, well, way back in the 1970s, early 1970s, I trained at Wimbledon Art School 
as a theatre designer. And I don't have a great time there, I have to say. Um, but it was the early 70s, so we know, we know that. Um, but, and I think I thought, once I left there, that I wouldn't really have that much to do with theatre. I couldn't really see a way into it, you know. Um, but I did some fringe theatre, some with small companies where we just would put things together and then put something on in a kind of small venue, that kind of thing. Um, but all the time, one of the things I learned in that three, four, three plus foundation, you know, four years at art school was to kind of broaden all my kind of horizons. You know, I didn't know anything about really that much about classical music and uh, opera and that before I went there, but they were very interested in that, the, the people teaching me. But what I kind of got from that was the, the multi-layered sort of drama of an opera. You know, it's not a coincidence that a soap opera is called a soap opera. You know, it's that, it's that everything's extreme. Yeah. So it's every day, but it's every day on the extreme. So, you know, you fall in love, you fall in love hard, you know, you get jealous, you kill somebody, you know. So it is a bit ridiculous, a bit overblown. But the fabulous thing is there's so many layers. There's the music, there's the, the singing, there's the, uh, the costumes, there's the sets. But even that thing, when, when they're singing in opera, as, as I'm sure you know, there's this brilliant thing where... I could be singing what I'm, what I'm, what I want to say. You could be singing what you're thinking, and someone else could be doing both. But we're all kind of singing to the same song, and I just think uh, I really love that. I really love the sort of complexity of that because it's the complexity of every day. You know, if I'm talking to you, I'm also thinking. I don't know, is the weather going to change by the time I need to go out? Or you're thinking, oh, I'm glad the technology is doing what it's supposed to be doing. You know, so it's real, but it's sort of hyper blown. So this show will kind of give you some, I'm hoping, give you some of those experiences because audiences come with those experiences. Everybody has has some kind of drama in their life. Lots of tragedy, um, lots of regrets, lots of hopes, you know, and they bring those in the room with them. And I'm hoping they kind of, the work triggers some of those emotions and they kind of, I don't know, uh, feel like they're part, the people coming are part of that drama because they, even though, we might be standing next to two people and what they're thinking and feeling is kind of going on inside. They're not clapping or waving their mobile phones in the air or those kind of... You know, Interactive. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You can't, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it seems very sedate in an art gallery, mm -hmm. but it's because all the emotions and the feelings and the thoughts that you're having are kind of with yourself and inside, yeah. So it doesn't look exciting, but I think sometimes visual art can, and going to, to galleries or events can be exciting, but in a slightly different way, you know. Yeah, great insight. And um, I, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking to myself, there's going to be a load of people who don't know much about you. You buy yeah. let's, let's, let's dig down into that a little bit. I mean, you, you mentioned you... Uh, trained at theatre school but before that where were you born where were your parents born. from what are the roots yeah. like talk yeah, to me yeah. about the, how you I'm find born, yourself in this space yes I was born in Zanzibar uh, East Africa you know, Ireland of, the of um, East Africa or oh, is you oh good I'm glad it's not me um, in um, uh, that's now now Tanzania because oh, I, I was born in 1954 it was Zanzibar um, and uh, my father uh it was Comoran, actually, from the islands of Comoros, just a little bit further off the coast. Um, and he met my mother when he was in London um, studying at uh, University College. And my mother was um, studying at the Royal College of Art. And so this is like the early 1950s. 
Uh, my mother is a white English woman, and um, or I say is, um, she died last year, but you know how it is with hearing her. Of course, I understand. I understand. Still there with somehow. Of course. Um, and uh, I was born, you know, in the July of 1954, and by the early part of November 1954, my father was dead. Um, he he, they met, you know, in London, but he went after his training. He went back to Zanzibar, and she sailed uh, over some weeks to Zanzibar and married. They married there. And um, and then they, after a, a you know however many respectable time, uh, they had uh, me. You know, like a year after that. But by the time I was four months old, he was dead. And uh, he used to, like many, 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 many people, get malaria every you know year, like as kind of like getting a cold kind of thing. And this one year, it just was too much, and he died. And so she had some choices, uh, but you know, it was in 1950s. She had some choices. She, my father's family said, well, you could stay here with the, with the baby, or if you, if you want, we'll look after the baby and you can go back to England and, you know, like start a new life. Um, or, you know, which would break our hearts, you can, you can take the baby and, and go to England. And, you know, she had, she had family there. And although, in a way, it w I think it probably would have been better if we'd stayed, but I can see maybe it just would have been hard for her. But I think I, I would have been a, a similar person, probably, but a different person if I'd grown yeah, up. Yeah, I understand. Uh, you know? Yeah. Um, Sometime after that, you know, sort of 1964, there was the, the big uh, revolution. And I think that pr probably just because my, my father's family were like um, a sort of teachers and clerks, that kind of family thing, you know, they, they weren't big high time professionals or they, they were kind of everyday kind of uh, civil servant type people, I suppose you'd say, that kind of people. And I think in the, and they came from the Comores, of course, they were not Zanzibari. And I, so I think 10 years later, maybe we would have all three of us, had you been still alive, come to England maybe. So it's hard to know. So that was a kind of complicated start. And, but it means that almost all my life, I've lived in, in Britain. Um, and I spent the early part of my life from, from being uh, you know, four months old, six months old, to when I was in my mid-30s in London. So I went to school in London, I went to art school in London. And then like when I was 30 something, I just could not find work. You know, I had a, I had a lot of work waitressing, um, trying to make art exhibitions, uh, working in um, a law centre, you know, just answering the telephone, trying to sort because those are the days of, I mean, it's still the days of, but it was a, a lot of the days of all that stop and search uh, stuff, you know, the early, early 80s. And they needed lots of people to be like answering the telephone and making calls to try to get solicitors to go to police stations and all that. They just needed volunteers to do that. So I did a bit of that, community work, but you know, all of it while making artwork and stuff. But I, I couldn't get like a regular job, um, like teaching in an art school or, or you know, anything. So um, I, somebody, a really, really interesting curator offered me a job in the north of England. And because my mother originally, originally, before she was in London being in art school, came from the north of England, I knew it. You know, I knew the place, I knew the pace of it. I kind of found it a bit boring and a bit slow. But I thought, well, I'll go, I'll go for that job, I'll stay for a bit and then I'll get another job. Well, I stayed for a bit and I got another job in the north of England and I've been there ever since. So I live in um, Preston, 
which is a small city. It's really a big town, but it has got city status. And it's kind of really about 45 minutes or so from Manchester and about 45 minutes from Liverpool. So those are the big cities that I'm near. Um, and, and I've been teaching at the uh, university there in the art department for the past uh, 30 years. My last, my, my, my last question then, because mm. I'm, I'm glad you gave me um, the background on, you know, where you're coming from, because I know that your works, you know, we could probably sit here and talk for a couple of days about, yeah. you know, some of the things that you're involved in. And I'm hoping that everybody that goes down to this exhibition, because they've got time to get down there, yeah, um, yeah. really gets a, a, a brief insight into some of the things that you've done, because I think um, they're, it's going to prompt them to go and look elsewhere. Uh, some of your other things, your work with women specifically. Now, there's one piece I want you to kind of kind of embellish on a little bit that I know okay. people are going to be fascinated by, and it's a 25-foot um, painting, which I know you've done in collaboration with another yeah. artist. Yeah. I know that that's a, a, it takes pride of place um, in this exhibition. So just talk about that uh, and for what reasons. Okay, well, it's a, it's a new piece, and any artist you talk to always likes their new things better than they like their old things. Um, so uh, we made this work in 2020, so in in the middle of lockdown, for an exhibition that was that took place in Brussels, um, in Belgium, and uh, because it was locked down, we've never seen it in real life. Okay, we've only seen it, we made it in real life, but we've never seen it in its complete state in the room with it. So it's really frightening <laughs> because. Everyone says it's okay. Well, those people in Belgium that came liked it, but you know, that's another thing. So what I did was I got all kinds of objects. Some of them were, um, well, in my house and some of them were in the studio and some of them were just stuff, things like paper bags, clock, musical instruments, parts of a piano, parts of a bed, uh, maps, uh, pieces of ceramics. And what you'll see is all these found objects, all in a, a line, if you like, around the wall, and painted across all of them are 64 patterns painted in blue. So different blues, different patterns, patterns from all over the world, all over West Africa, East Africa, Japan, um, European, all kinds of patterns, but in this kind of uh, thin sort of line. And the each of the um, uh, 64 patterns is because there are 64 bars in um, the song by Joni Mitchell called Blue. And ah, right. on the... Okay. On, and then the second part of the installation is uh, coming from six uh, speakers is um, the, the piano part of Blue, and then me in three different languages, English, French, and Flemish, because of course this thing was happening in Brussels, um, talking about um, the color blue. So I'm talking about the blue of my um, Auntie Betty's kitchen, uh, the blue of tiles on the mosque, um, the blue of the sky uh, at midnight in Havana. And I'm doing it in these three different languages. I only speak English. I don't actually speak any other language. At right, all. Okay. I can ask for a drink in French and German, but I don't <laughs> speak anything else. And but what we found out from talking to a fabulous curator who works in Brussels, she doesn't work there anymore, but she, she works in another gallery, uh, a really wonderful curator called Sophia Dati, and now hopefully she'll be coming to do some things at Tate with us. Um, um, she told us that the music schools in uh, Brussels, there, there always have to be two music schools, one where they're speaking French and one where they're speaking Flemish. 
And what we were going to do before, uh, you know, it became impossible because of lockdown was do some projects with students there. And I wanted to see uh, what the black students were doing that was different in the French school or in the Belgian school, because of course, the, you know, that wide colonial um, taking over, there would, there would bound to be some really interesting kind of links between um, uh, uh, people from the former Belgian Congo, you know, and people from the west coast of France, you know, it would have been interesting to see where people were there with their backgrounds and families came from those different places. What, what were they doing that was different or the same, or that could be kind of, we could make a whole new project, we hoped, with, with some, some students. And so I wanted to make a piece that was in the gallery so that when those students came, they would be hearing me say these things in English, but also attempting, because of course all of them would have had two languages, whatever language they spoke with their elder family and French or Flemish, to kind of make a conversation, if you like, with that, that mm, challenge, difficulty, <laughs> problem of having to learn a language in order to belong in a place that doesn't necessarily want you to belong anyway. So it, it's a project that, that was made specifically for a place, but I think even in Tate, there'll be moments when that sort of struggle for belonging, that uh, all those, um, all those feelings you get when you try, when you're remembering something and remembering a place and remembering who you were with, all the, hopefully all those things will, will come to the fore when you're, when you're in that room. Lubana, I think um, it's going to be a, a well-attended exhibition. So I don't think you've got any reason for nerves whatsoever. I think people are going to be suitably impressed and um, engaged enough to, maybe want to do it more than once because I don't know if you can take it all in in, in one sitting to be honest with you but um yeah, yeah it's it's gonna it's gonna be an interesting period is there anything else you want to kind of leave our viewers yeah. readers listeners with before we go I mean I think you know you mentioned the the work that I that I've been doing or that I did mostly you know quite a long time ago with other women uh, artists and um you know, uh, there are exhibitions that are going around at the moment with, uh, like from uh, Veronica Ryan, who I used to work with in the 1980s. And you remember Shyla Berman had that fabulous um, neon thing at the front of uh, Tate Britain, which was like mm -hmm. sensational. And Shitapa Biswas, uh, her show's at Baltic at the moment. I think that would be touring. Um, you know, so what's kind of really rewarding and a relief to me after all these time, all this time is that lots of us, uh, Ingrid Pollard also is gonna have a show in Milton Keynes um, in the spring of 2022, that we're really getting the kind of spaces now where, you know, thousands of people can come and see the work and we're all able to demand, if you like, that there are extra programs as well as the, the exhibition itself, where people, artists, people are interested in talking to artists or musicians, you know, performance people can kind of come together and have conversations around the shows. You know, we're really trying to do this in a different way rather than just have kind of talking heads who, who only know about the, the history of art, kind of trying to mix up people who know about the history of other things with, with them. So, yeah, no, I want to say that as well. <laughs> no, that's fine. And, uh, and, and shine a light wherever you can. And I know you've always done that anyway. So it's, uh, it's typically in keeping with, with who you are. And I appreciate your time this morning. Um, it's been a pleasure. I'm going to be attending. So you know, Great, I'm, sure, thank I'm you. sure lots of people are. So yeah. thanks for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much indeed. Goodbye.